Hey guys, sorry we're a little late getting started tonight. We've had some serious technical difficulties. <laughs> I guess serious, it won't work on my laptop, and then we tried to swap laptops and use a different thing anyway. It's just the devil doesn't want me to talk tonight, I guess. And so I'm going to take some time and share with you from 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to say to you before we start tonight, before we open in prayer, if you have a prayer need, if you have some other need in your life, like someone to run an errand for you to pick up medicine or some groceries or whatever, please don't hesitate to call the office or call me. I've given you my cell phone number, and uh, you feel free to call or text us or email office at watchtopbaptist.org. Uh, we'll get your emails there. Uh, or call us at the church, 318-387-6372. Let us know. You can leave a message if we're not there. The office is open from, from 8 to 12, Monday to Thursday each week, right now, while we're in the midst of this crisis. And um, so just let us know. We're available here to help. We're still doing as much as we can, trying to find ways to send out a little video blast to you so I can stay in touch that way at least once a week. And uh, so anyway, just stay with us and uh, be patient with us and learning all these new technical things. And hopefully we'll have something new. I do want to tell you, Easter Sunday, we're preparing to have a drive-in service that morning. We're going to set up outside if it's not raining. And I think we've got an option, even if it is raining, we've got an FM transmitter where we're going to be able to, it looks like, be able to send out, do the message, the music and everything. And uh, you could sit in the parking lot in your car and uh, we could be under the drive through and you could tune into a certain radio station. We'll tell you that station and and you could listen to the music and the message, all, all of us right there in the parking lot. So we're going to have a lot of options for that day. We'll use microphone and speakers if it's a pretty day. So uh, that'll be at our regular 1045 on Easter Sunday morning. So don't forget that. Uh, all right, let's open with prayer. And don't forget to let us know if there's other ways we can pray for you. Father, we thank you that today we can come here on Wednesday night. And Father, just share the word with our people as we all are kind of experiencing new things, uh, uh, separation, maybe loneliness, maybe fear, maybe stress, frustration, whatever it may be. And Lord, I just pray that you just give us a word tonight from the scriptures, and God, that we may be encouraged, and God, that, that these uh, different hours might also be uh, some of our finer hours. And God, that you just bring something beautiful out of it. And so we're just going to put it all in your hands. You promised that Romans 8, 28, you bring good from it if we just submit to your way. And so we're going to do that, Lord. And uh, thank you. Teach us tonight as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, some of our technical difficulties tonight involves the PowerPoint. Uh, we, uh, mine quit working on my computer, and so we went to a different computer. And, and because it wouldn't open, I had to go to a different type of app. And it changed the color of everything. I had white letters, and it changed it to uh, dark letters, so it's not as easy to see. But I want to talk to you, 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to talk about that chapter because it's about how to deal with times of suffering or struggles that we're facing. I call it how to make the most of your extra time. It seems that a lot of us have a lot of extra time right now. Uh, not everybody. I know some of you are still working and uh, still having to keep a schedule. Uh, but for a lot of folks right now, they're kind of wondering what to do. They're twiddling their thumbs maybe, and, and maybe some fear is there, and uh, whatever it may be. But, you know, we should make the most of all of our time that we have. And so there's three things I want to point out tonight. The first six verses of 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to read those verses to you. And uh, uh, if we could take just a moment and Study what the scriptures has for us and think about what God is saying. Brother Hugh, can you bring those verses up here? Read them for us. Brother Hugh, Miss Stacy's here helping me tonight. And uh, this will also be available not only on Facebook, but also on our website here in the near future. Daniel's filming that. Read those first six verses for us. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Yeah. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live uh, the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. 
For we have spent enough of uh, our past lifetime in doing the will of Gentiles. Well, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these, um, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they, may, uh, they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but uh, live according to God in the spirit. Amen. Thank you. I put Brother Hill on the spot with that. I didn't pull up my Bible verse to print there, but uh, I appreciate him sharing that with us. First thing I'd like to talk to you about is how to deal with struggles and trials. Now, Jesus was talking, well, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, uh, was talking about the sufferings that the New Testament saints were going through. And because they identified with Christ, that brought some extra sufferings on them. But you know, sufferings our sufferings, some of the things we suffer, we may suffer because we are believers, but some of the things that we suffer, we don't suffer because we're believers, we just go through some hard times in our life. And the process, the principles are the same. So I want to say to you, first of all, how to make the most of your time is sometimes to deal with your struggles, deal with things that, you're, that are going on in your life, things that you've, you've struggled with in the past. I think sometimes we try to take the past and just cover it up and don't deal with things like forgiveness. Maybe there's someone that we, maybe it's a good time to just search our hearts. And you know the Bible tells us to examine ourselves and whether we're in the faith or not. And part of that examination is, you know, you want to get the most out of your faith. You want to get the most out of what God has done for you and what he's done in filling you with the Holy Spirit. But you know, sometimes undealt with sin in our life can quench or suppress the Holy Spirit in our life. And sometimes we need to think back. Are there, are there some things that we've not dealt with? Is there something, maybe someone hurt us, and we're not willing to, or we haven't forgiven that person? And we need to think about those things. Sometimes part of this time is to think about, you can use this time to not dwell on your past. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we need to think about the things that, We've suffered on this earth. Verse 1, Jesus talks about the things that he suffered on this earth. Jesus says a lot of the things that he suffered on this earth, he suffered because he chose the righteous path. He chose to walk the righteous way. He chose to reject the world. Therefore, the world hated him, the Bible says. And so we too, when we have, uh, have a, a close walk with the Lord, or we choose to do what's right, sometimes we're going to suffer also. We're going to suffer because... Maybe we didn't give in to the fun of the world or the group, the fun group. Uh, didn't go to all the parties, didn't participate in all the drugs. And you get called those names like being a goody two-shoes or a holy roller. And, and people make fun of us sometimes because we try to do what is right. Jesus did that, but he learned through that. And you know what? As we, life itself, whether it's an issue because of your faith or whether it's just a, the su things that we suffer it could be because of the loss of a loved one, someone that gets sick and passes away. We could lose someone for that reason. We could, be, we could suffer for that reason. But it may not be for that reason that we suffer. Maybe it's because of a, a marriage that's in trouble or children that have gone wayward. We don't need to just forget about things that God may be dealing with us about. Is there something we can do to to deal with the, the pains that we've had. How can, we, how can we deal with them in a godly way? And so, but we're, we're all going to have our tribulations on us in this life. He says just down in verse 12, a few verses later, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Every one of us are going to go through some days, some days struggles that are hard and those hard times are really kind of a, a trying time for us and the, the devil would love to use those things to tear us down but I'm here to tell you God will use those very same things to build us up God will use those things to make us uh, closer to him to make us more like him so it's important that all of us learn to deal with the issues of life 
And that's what Jesus is telling us here. He dealt with struggles because of the, the path that he chose. But let's look at some of the other things here, some of the other ways that we look at those struggles. How did Jesus overcome a lot of those things? Because here's what will happen. The more we think about those struggles and those sufferings in our life, we can become depressed. We can become discouraged. And when we become discouraged, and, and you know, right now, even with the, the fears of the world going on with this coronavirus, and uh, sometimes those kind of things can throw us into depression, and all we do is think about it. And you know, God says that here's the way Jesus overcame the things that he suffered. It was by his mindset. Let's look at what verse 2 says there again. It says of that, it says that, that he no longer should live the rest of the time in flesh. I'm sorry, it's the verse, uh, uh, that Jesus, it tells us that Jesus chose not to live his life. I'm sorry, verse 1. And he suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves also with this same mind. Because he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What Jesus was saying is even though he suffered, he knew it was for the glory of God. He faced hardships. He went to the cross for us, not because of something he did. And his mindset was as long as it glorifies God. His mindset was, I'm here for God. And uh, uh, Dr. Rick Warren, when he wrote his book about, you know, the purpose-driven church, uh, he, he talked in that about that, in the purpose-driven life. He talked about how it's, all, it's not all about you. It's all about God. And we've, we've slipped away from that. We, we lose our focus on that sometimes, and we do think it's all about us. In fact, sometimes we're frustrated when bad things happen. I got frustrated this afternoon when this crazy computer wouldn't work right. I got frustrated because of, out of the blue, it wants to quit working with PowerPoint, and it's hindered my presentation tonight, and that makes me look bad, so I get frustrated. That's what gets us frustrated when we make ourselves look bad. But we think it ought not happen. We, we think because we're Christians, because we go to church, because we tithe, because we pray, we ought not have any hardships. And, and you know, really, it's laughable to even call that suffering a hardship. It's really not suffering. It's not people have suffered. And some people are suffering now. But you know, the mindset, you can sit around and you can sit around and focus all your energy on, oh, I don't want to get the coronavirus. Or you can say, I really hope through this whole thing, God gets glorified. I hope through this whole thing, maybe revival breaks out. God's got a purpose in allowing this to happen. I'm not saying God caused it, but I'm saying God at least allowed it to happen. Sometimes God allows things to happen for the purpose of, of maybe... Maybe a chastisement. I'm not going to tell you. We just finished studying the book of Jeremiah, and all through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, if you don't repent of your idolatries and you people of Israel, if you don't get yourself right with God, he said, man, God is going to let the Babylonians come in here and take you. They said, ah, oh, we're okay. We didn't do anything that bad. And uh, he said, okay, Babylonians going to come take you then. Friends, I want you to know that God could be saying to the world, You've turned to your idolatries, your immoralities, this perversions that run in our world today, and uh, the, the murder of, of children for convenience sake in abortion. And uh, all these things are really just, God, God's probably had enough. And so God allows us to get out there and walk on our own and do our own thing. But the Bible says that way where we do our own thing, that way that seems so smart to us, the end of that way is destruction and death. And so we have to realize that, that, that God may be allowing us to go this way, removing his hand of protection from us, that we just get out there and get right what we ask for. Do it ourselves, and we can find ourselves in the judgment of God. Uh, in the judgment of God, I guess you could say, but also the, the, the hands of the world and the, the destruction of the world. And so as we look at these verses today, we're reminded that, that Jesus had to fix his mind. The way he got through his hardships was to fix his mind on the, the will of the Father. And so I remind each of us, what is the will of God in this? Is the will of God to deliver you from every problem? Or is the will of God to turn our nation and our world to him. Is that, is the, does God allow us to go through some hardships and we're seeking and we're hurting so that we can realize that when we look up, it's God who's got his hand of grace stretched out to us. It is God who is reaching out to us, wanting to deliver us. 
But we've got to receive that grace of God. And you don't just take the grace of God and say, but God, the rest of you I don't want. When you get the grace of God, you get all of God. And so we realize that we, that means we want to go His way. And so today we talk about this. Uh, protecting of the mind was part of that whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about us putting on that whole armor of God. The mind is one of those things. How we think about things. You can sit around and think about, oh, it's terrible and the bad is coming and it's surrounding us everywhere. Or you can say, I don't know what's going on, but I know this. God is still in control. And God's going to be glorified. And that's going to be my mindset. That's the mind of Christ. It's not about me. Or he wouldn't have went to that cross. It's about God. It's about God's will. Whatever God's doing, I don't always know what God's doing. But I know to just submit to what he's doing. He wants what's best for me. Three things we have to put on. It tells us there, if you're going to, if you're going to be submitted to God in the midst of all this time that you have and, and the, the sufferings of the world, you're going to have to put on that belt of truth. That's one of those pieces that you put that belt on and it, and it teaches you, man, I am, I am held together by truth. So right now, I just want to know what truth is. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of lies out there in the world. A lot of that stuff you get on the internet. A lot of that stuff you get from your friends. A lot of them phone calls. A lot of them movies you watch. It's made up of lies, lies, lies. Oh, go out and have, have an affair with a different woman every night. It's going to be all right. No, it's not going to be all right. Keep drinking. Keep drugging. Doing your thing. It's going to be all right. No, it's not going to be all right. There's a payday someday. You're going to answer to God for that. And that's what he says later on in our text here today. Are you a person who's seeking after truth? Are you following after the lies of the devil? Look at this one. The breastplate of righteousness. Are you a person who, who says your heart is protected by righteousness? I mean, if it's not righteous, it don't get to your heart. Think about it. Righteousness is the opposite of evil. It's the opposite of doing what you think is always the best. It's what God thinks is best. Righteousness is trying to do what is right in the eyes of God. Is that protecting your heart? Is the helmet of salvation protecting your mind? What you think about? If you're going to be that, that believer, that, that man, that woman of God that you know you should be, if, you, if you're saved, and I'll be honest with you, some of them sitting here watching me tonight or, or watching me later on as you watch this video, you may, you may say to yourself, well, I know he believes that, but I don't necessarily believe all that, or I'm not interested in all that, or I'm not really concerned about what God wants me to do. Friend, you need to check your heart. It's, you know, you can go to church and be a member of the church and not necessarily be saved. If you don't care what God thinks, there's some issues there in your life. I'm talking to you about the Word of God. Listen, this is how Jesus dealt with all that time that he had. He suffered, number three, he said he suffered because he chose holiness. Man, verse... Verses 2 and 3. Because he chose to reject the flesh and the lust of men, it says. Uh, he says from verse 3, we've spent enough of, in our, of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. That's the ungodly people. That's the way it's referred to. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. He says, you know, and, and that's just a party hound. That's the person who's living for self, for flesh, and, and, and getting their own highs. And he says, man, that's what we were. We're not that anymore. And so that's the mindset we see that Peter has, and Peter's expressing to these Christians who were suffering. Many of these, if you, if you were a first, Testament Christian, first, first century Christian, uh, many times when you became, if you were Jewish, particularly Peter ministered to the Jews, if you were Jewish and you became a Christian, a follower of Christ, many times they literally had a funeral for you. The family would have a funeral for you because as far as they were concerned, you were dead. You would many times lose your job. Many times you'd lose your, uh, your, your land, your farming abilities, a uh, way to make an income that way. You lost so many, you lost many and most, if not all of your friends and your family. So think about it. Man, you've lost everything to follow Christ. And then you may have the government chasing after you, people accusing you of stuff because you didn't buy into the system of that day in the Roman culture. And so he says Jesus suffered because he chose doing things God's way. And my friend, I'm not telling you today, if you do it your way, I mean, if you do things God's way, it's always going to be easy because sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's hard to do things God's way. 
to be rejected by your friends, to not feel like you can just be a part of the fun world. Because the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a little while, for just a little while. The world, verse 4 says, the world and your friends will ridicule you. The world and your friends don't want you to do what's right. I've always wondered why we call those people friends. When they're pulling us away from God, away from righteousness, unhappy with our choice, yet we want them to be our friends. Or we consider them friends. But verse 4 says, you don't do that. That's not what it's about. So I'd ask you that question. Do you struggle with giving up the world? Man, how many times do we we want to we want to be of God, but we want to be of the world too. We want to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. How many times have I had people, particularly young people over the years, come to me and say, Well, let me ask you, preacher, can I listen to this kind of music? Can I go to these kind of movies? And what about what about this? What if somebody says this? Is that a bad word? And you know, they always want to know what they can do just as close to the world. And be just as just a little bit worldly, but not real worldly. They want to know how they can walk on that fine line. I've always wanted one of them to come to me and say, you know, Pastor, I used to I used to wonder about how to walk on that line and how to be a little bit in the world and a little bit in God. But now I walk way over here and I just stay away from that line. I just do what God wants me to do. You know, that's what I want to hear. I want people to say, what's it look like over here on the God side? For I just totally reject the world and the things of the world. And so Jesus, that's what he did. And he got a lot of criticism before that. Maybe somebody, again, here struggling with something in the past. Something you need to deal with. Something you need to put under the blood and let it go. Failures, mistakes of the past. Don't let those things weigh you down. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was able to, to take all the hates Man, there were people who hated him, trapped him, lied about him, spit on him, stoned him. And yet, the Bible says, when they reviled against him, in other words, when they poured their vile wickedness out on him, he gave them none back. He was, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He willingly gave himself. He didn't, he didn't treat other people the way they treated him. And so, maybe you've struggled with different things in your life. You'll have some struggles. Number four, look at your struggles with the mind of Jesus. We naturally want to face our struggles with hurting someone back. They've hurt us, we want to hurt them. But Jesus didn't do that. They could slap him, and he'd say not a word. I think most of us struggle with that. We're not quite there yet. We, we struggle with that, but we shouldn't. We should be able to say, you can give me whatever you want, but I'm not going to give you the same thing back. That was the mindset of Christ. Christ was more concerned about people's salvation than he was concerned about their vindictiveness. He was concerned about them being right with God. And that's what he saw. He saw people that were headed to hell. And that's what bothered him the most. Number five, how we handle our struggles reveals our spiritual maturity. We have all kinds of struggles we, we face and things that are sometimes hard. But he tells us here that in verse 5 that you're going to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Every one of us one day, when you're thinking about how you're going to handle this life, and, you know, I tell couples and people with young people getting married or they're already married and having marriage problems, I tell them time, from time to time, that when we go from just a low-level disagreement to an extreme shouting, screaming argument in no time, there's a spiritual problem. We haven't gotten that. The Bible says that one of the spiritual gifts is, uh, is, is to be able to have that uh, self-restraint, if you will, to be able to, be, uh, to control our emotions and not let our emotions control us. And so because of that, we, we sometimes, when we don't have that spiritual cutoff level, we just blow by it. We just let our emotions rule. And God says we're not thinking with that spiritual mind, that mind of Christ, when we do that. Ignoring our hurts 
things that have hurt you in the past will weigh you down. And how we handle these matters by the or will be judged by the Lord, as I said in verse 5. It's going to be a time of, it's going to be a day when we're going to give account of what we've done with our life. You may be out there running, having fun right now, living it up, partying with the drugs, the alcohol, whatever it may be. What Peter says to people is, for those that treat you wrong, for those that, the people that were being abused and, and suffering in his day, Peter says, please understand, there's going to be a day we're going to all stand before God. He said, you and I are going to stand, or you're going to stand before God. Peter said, we're going to stand before God. But also, these who have mistreated us, they're going to stand before God. And they're going to give account of everything they've done. And we're going to leave it in the Lord's hands, Peter's saying. Man's thoughts about us don't really matter. I like what he says in verse 6. He said, for this reason the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men and the flesh, but live according to God and the Spirit. He said, for this reason, the people who are dying out there today, people who are being killed, this gospel is preached to them. He said, he said we've got to all. He said, they're going to be judged by men according to men in the flesh, but live according to God and the Spirit. In other words, the world doesn't like what you're doing, doesn't like what you stand for. And he says, yeah, we're going to be judged somewhat by the world. We're going to, they're going to judge us. But he says, you and I are going to live in the Spirit. So in other words, he is saying that it don't really matter what they think. All that matters is what God thinks. You know, he is the final judge. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so he is the only one we're accountable to. All right? So, uh, second thing I want you to see today as we talk about these uh, different things, that's dealt with the suffering. One of the things that we can do in our life is always just kind of go back and look at our life. What can I do better? Who do I need to forgive? How can I handle a situation better? And sometimes just think about how we could improve in some of the time that we have. Spend a little more time in prayer. But that's where I want to go next. First part of this time, deal with your mistakes, put them under the blood, let God forgive those things and move on with your life. The second thing uh, is, is dealing with uh, maybe mistakes you've made or, or in dealing with people, maybe you didn't forgive somebody. Maybe you have a, a hindered relationship that you could go work on. You could call somebody. But, but use this time for spiritual benefits, what I'm saying. Is there something in your life that you need to get out of that? that's hindering your relationship with God. So think about those things. Think about the things that you suffer. The second thing is delight in your salvation. In verses 7 through 11, we see uh, Peter kind of changes his tone after telling them about how to deal with their sufferings and things that they've been going through. He talks about the goodness of their salvation, how they could stop and think about uh, their salvation. And so... As we think about that today, I want you to think about what we're looking at. We're looking at the salvation that God offers. <laughs> Let me get your scripture there, Brother Hugh. Think about what he's saying here in verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. And love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable one to another without grumbling. You know, that's one of the things we do during this time of the coronavirus is being hospitable to one another, helping each other. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's listen to what that says. Think about what he's saying. First of all, verse 7, be serious about prayer. Man, spend some extra time in prayer. Because one of the things is it's going to save this whole world. It's not going to be the next intervention. It's going to be God withdrawing his hand, maybe, if it's judgment, about, and God answering our prayers. What did God tell us, the Judeans and those from Judah and those from Israel as, as Babylon was about to come get them? He said, repent, guys, repent. Did you know that's the first message that John the Baptist preached was repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand? And the second message, I mean the message that Jesus preached 
was the first, his first message was repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Many times we don't want to do that. We think about that today. What if the COVID, what if the COVID-19 was the end of man? End of mankind. It became a disease that changed and no one could find a solution. And, and we're moving quickly toward a dangerous end of mankind. What if it was that? Is God trying to get our attention? We don't know what it is yet. We're almost in the early stages of it. But could it be God wants us to get on our knees, repent of our sins, and get serious? Oh, if there's anything we need to pray, pray right now is pray for revival yeah. in our nation and in the world, really. The world needs revival. I know there's a lot of good godly people all over the world, but there's a lot of folks that have have just basically slapped God in the face and said, God, we don't want nothing to do with you. And that's the world we live in. And so today we look at these texts of Scripture and we think about it. He says, be serious in prayer. Be serious, verse 8, be serious about love. You know, we can talk love, but are we serious about it? We can talk about loving, but love is kind, the Bible says. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs the Bible says. Love doesn't puff up. Knowledge puffs up, but love doesn't. On and on, we can talk about love. You know, love's never defined as a feeling. It's defined as a commitment someone makes to someone else. We're to love each other. We're to be committed to church, to one another. Just as God's committed to us, we're committed to God. I think about this, and I think about love. Do we really even understand love? I'll be honest, over the years in, in the ministry, I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, I really don't know what love is. Never had a parent tell me they love me. And they grew up not really knowing how to love. Because love embraces so many things like forgiveness and grace and mercy. Relationships. New stars. Obviously, our salvation and the cross. Love is a is that eternal language between God and His people. We need to be serious about love. Love will lead us to help others. That that next verse talks about hospitality, uh, verse nine. But but love, serious love, will lead to helping other people. We'll we'll realize it's not about us. It's not just about us. Um, love will drive you. To minister to someone else because you love them more than you even love your own life. See, God called us to be lovers of mankind. Jesus taught us and the scriptures teach us that we're to esteem others as greater than ourselves. And I've got a beautiful little story I want to share with you about that in just a moment. Before I do, I want to look at these last two verses, verses 10 and 11. Be serious about representing Jesus. Be serious about it. Represent Him. Wherever you go, wear His mantle. Paul said, I love one of the things Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. And over the years, people have been out and had themselves crucified. And they thought that's what they were doing by getting crucified. So they could have the nail marks in their hands and in their feet. That's really not what he was talking about. Even though you could say that's a literal interpretation. But he was literally saying, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord because I've given myself to God. I've been a living sacrifice. I have, I have the, just like I have characteristics. My wife told me today, looking at one of the videos I shot Monday, she said, you're looking more and more like your dad. You know? And... And, you know, my children look a little bit like me. And, and, you know, your children look like you. And we think about that. But God's children don't look like Him. They don't have His characteristics, His fruit of the Spirit in their life. And so we think about that today. We're reminded that, that um, we represent Him wherever we go. And Paul reminds us of that. I mean, Peter reminds us of that, just as Paul did. But are you a person that's serious? about love. What if you 
going and ministering to someone, witnessing to someone, and that person gets saved, maybe that person's not saved, and they get saved, and you lose your life. You pick up the virus, and you lose your life. The ultimate love. Jesus said, no greater love than a man lay down his life for another, for a friend. Would you be willing to love somebody to death? It's a pretty tough question, isn't it? I'd like to tell you a story about one man who was on the Titanic. You may have heard it. His name was John Harper. He was a preacher who had had left over in England, Europe, and he was headed to Chicago to preach at Moody Church, famous Moody Church in Chicago. And in fact, some articles I read said he'd actually been called to be the next pastor of Moody Church. And he was going there to accept the position. He was a widower. His wife had died, and he had a six-year-old daughter, and she was with him. When the iceberg hit the Titanic, they started down uh, as, as it began to sink. Uh, that's the story, but it <laughs> doesn't have the picture. <laughs> and uh, as it began to sink, Mr. Moody, uh, Mr. Harper said that the story of everyone who watched what was happening said that... Uh, the ship began to sink. He put his daughter on that life raft, put her in the, in the water, and told some others if they asked if they would keep an eye on her. And before the ship went down, he was going all across the deck telling people about Jesus Christ before they went down. Are you saved? Do you know you're going to heaven? This, we are about to die. The, the, all the life rafts are full. We're going to die. We're more than likely, it's icy water out there. We're going to die. Do you know Christ? And he'd share the gospel with them. One man got offended. Offended that he would talk to him about God. And Mr. Harper had his life vest on and he took it off. That man didn't have one yet. He took it off and he handed it to him. He said, sir, I know where I'm going. You're going to need this a lot worse than me. And he gave that man his life vest. When the ship went under, he jumped in the water. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, there are people everywhere. There weren't enough life boats, you know rescue boats for everyone and there were people floundering around in the water some with vests hypothermia was setting in on many of them but without a vest he swam from person to person shared the gospel with each person he said you're going to die we're all going to die here more than likely and as he shared with each person many of them gave their life to Christ one man at a few years later and I, I wish the video was working right now I would show it to you. It's a beautiful video that goes through the whole thing. A man spoke at that conference just I think it was four years later. He said, Mr. Harper slam over to me and he shared the gospel with me. He said, it doesn't look like we're going to make it. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to be saved. And he just kept talking to me. And in a few minutes he, he went away to talk, talk to someone else and just a few minutes later he saw me still there. He swam back over and he said, I want to give you one more chance to be saved. And that man said, I prayed that night to receive Jesus Christ. And he was at that conference sharing his testimony in Canada. And he said, just a few seconds after I prayed to receive Christ, Mr. Harper went under. He said, I was the last convert of John Harper. Here's a man who gave his life. It's possible he could have gotten on the life raft with his daughter because he was a widower. She was, he was the only support that she had. But he chose not to. Because the salvation of those others was more important than his extension of his life. What if that was us? Are we willing to swim to someone and tell them all we really have to do is sometimes walk across the street? A risk a little bit for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll show you that video a little later. Maybe we can put it on Facebook.
It was April 15, 1912, the year of our Lord, when the HMS Titanic sank beneath the icy waters of the North Atlantic, taking with it 1,517 lives. The largest and most luxurious ship known to man at the time was gone, reminding the world of our frailty as human beings. But there is more to the sinking of the Titanic than a historical tragedy. There is a story of courageous heroism and unshakable faith. John Harper was aboard the Titanic when she set sail from Southampton, England on her maiden voyage. An evangelist, originally from Glasgow, Scotland, he was well known throughout the United Kingdom as a charismatic, passionate speaker who led many to Christ through his gift of preaching. In 1912, Reverend Harper received an invitation to speak at the Moody Church in Chicago, USA. And on April 11, 1912, John Harper boarded the Titanic. The world was captivated with the ship. Widely proclaimed as unsinkable, it was the largest movable object ever built by man at the time. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were aboard. While many of the passengers spoke of business deals, acquisitions, and material desires, John Harper was diligently sharing the love of Christ with others. In the days leading up to the tragedy, survivors reported seeing Harper living like a man of faith, speaking kind words, and sharing the love of Christ. On the evening of April 14th, as passengers danced in the ballroom and tried their luck at the card tables, John Harper put his daughter to bed and read his devotions as he did every night. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic struck an iceberg. The unsinkable ship was doomed. Either in disbelief or unaware at the time, passengers continued about their pleasures. It wasn't until the ship's crew sent up a series of distress flares, lighting up the moonless night, that passengers finally realized the seriousness of their situation. Then chaos ensued. It all happened so fast that John Harper could only react. His response left an historic example of courage and faith. Harper awakened his daughter, picked her up, and wrapped her in a blanket before carrying her up to the deck. There he kissed her goodbye and handed her to a crewman who put her into boat number 11. Harper knew he would never see his daughter again, and his daughter would be left an orphan at six years of age. Harper then gave his life jacket to a fellow passenger, ending any chance of his survival. While the light of otherworldly ambitions began to flicker and die, John Harper's burned even brighter. As the sounds of terror and mayhem continued, Harper focused on his God-given purpose. Survivors reported seeing him on the upper deck, surrounded by terrified passengers, on his knees, praying for their salvation. At 2.40 a.m., the Titanic disappeared beneath the North Atlantic, leaving a mushroom-like cloud of smoke and steam above her grave, and tragically, over 1,000 people, including Harper, fighting for their lives in the icy water. He managed to find a piece of floating wreckage to hold onto. Quickly, he swam up to every person he could find, urging those about him to put their faith in Jesus Christ. While death forced others to face the folly of their life's pursuits, John Harper's goal of winning men to Jesus Christ became more vital. Soon, John Harper began to succumb to the sea. Even in his last moment, this tireless man of undying faith continued his life pursuit of winning lost souls. I am a survivor of the Titanic. I was one of only six people out of 1,517 to be pulled from the icy waters on that dreadful night. Like the hundreds around me, I found myself struggling in the cold, dark waters of the North Atlantic. The wail of the perishing was ringing in my ears when there floated by me a man who called to me, Is your soul saved? I heard him call out to others as he and everyone around me sank beneath the waters to eternity. There alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I cried to Christ to save me. I am John Harper's last convert. Harper, as he knew then, would not survive. But his example of undying faith and commitment to the Word of God lives as an example for all to see. In the midst of that desperate assemblage of drowning men, women, and children, 
he pointed them to the cross, and thus, as he lived, died with that one name upon his lips, Jesus Christ. Number three, develop your spiritual strength. Those last verses, the last part of that chapter, chapter 12, I mean verse 12 down through to verse 19, says develop your spiritual strengths. Man, through all the things that you're going through, through all the sufferings, through all of this, through all the persecutions you may face for walking with God, he said, I want you to, to overcome. Peter talks about the, he, he says those trials that it brought on by the world, by our world and resisting the faith. He says in John 15, 18, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, so sufferings are going to come. Don't think it's strange, he said. Remember verse 12, when you face those fiery trials. Could I ask you, does the world recognize which side you're on? Does the world recognize who you're committed to? Verses 13 and 14 talks about how the world is watching us. How do you handle the hard times? How you handle what matters? Could God be in the process of showing the church who we are to be? Could God be trying to... I have a sermon I do sometimes called uh, Would the Real Church Please Stand Up? Because I think sometimes God may be looking for the real church. The ones who don't come just to meet what society says is appropriate or what their husband wants or wife wants or, or the children that come just because mom and dad wants them to be there but the church who really loves God and wants to be the church. In the last verse 19 he says suffer according to the will of God. I mean that really sums it all up. Are you willing to go through some hard times and say as long as God's glorified that's okay. As long as God wins, I'm willing to lose. That's the mind of Christ. And that's a mindset that says, I'm going to love, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to care, no matter what happens. And as long as God gets glory, I'm okay with that. Whatever happens to me is not the important part. And I think that's the message that I got out of this from Peter as he talked about how to go through times of trial, suffering. Do it for God's glory. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you that tonight we can come together and study and I pray this just give us a word to, to think about some things we can do in this time. We can obviously know that we can deal with maybe some failures in our life and God, put those things under the blood and move on, God. Don't let those things weigh us down. But then also to, to renew our strength, our spiritual strength, God, that we don't quit, but that we persevere. And even when it gets tough, we persevere. We keep going. We keep our head up, Lord. And, and God, you tell us to, to love fervently. Pray seriously, Lord. God, to, to show hospitality to those who need it. So, Lord, help us to get our eyes off of ourselves and find a way that we can show somebody Jesus. Because sometimes it's in the darkest days that our light will shine the brightest. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Washtenaw Baptist Church. What you're even doing now, the great things I'm hearing. Continue to give us peace and continue to bring glory to yourself through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.